and everything's good. Thanks. So complexity-wise, um, if I do it naively, then it's cubic in the number of instances. Um, if I do it smartly, I can get it down to linear. Getting it down to linear, so essentially what you do is remember all the nice optimization techniques that Vishy talked about for convex optimization. You use those, use low rank properties and so on, and then you can actually you know, get a fairly good estimate. So that's fairly effective. Now here's where things get interesting. I mean, this is sort of the stand-up worrying problem, and everybody knows how to deal with it. Now imagine that you don't observe all the YIs. Right? So what would you do? Well, you just treat them as latent variables, and you perform inference in them as we discussed, right? So you could, for instance, use the EM algorithm or you know, some other non-convex optimization procedure which deals with these guys. Once we do this, we are immediately in transduction land. Right. So we're doing transduction if we don't observe all the YIs. Of course, if you write it in this way, you might get that paper accepted at a minor conference. If you call it transduction, you can probably write two to 300 papers about it. Guilty of the same crime, so I'm allowed to bitch about it. Um, okay. The other thing that's quite fun is these XIs, right? Now, assume that I don't observe all the coefficients of these XIs. At that point, immediately, that parameter alpha starts getting really important. Because now I want to get a good model of what my XIs look like for the prediction purpose. However, it also tells me that maybe if I just observe a partial XI, estimating the remaining coefficients here in isolation of YI is not the smartest idea. Instead, what I should be doing is, I should be estimating the remaining coefficients of the XIs and the YI simultaneously. After all, you know, it's a, they're all unknown variables then. So let's jointly estimate it. And, well, this is basically what missing variable estimation does. Again, you can write papers about that. But it's really simple in the graphical model speak. Does that assume the missing variables, though? Um, well, actually, it doesn't assume that. So this is, but, but this is a very good question. So do the XIs need to be missing at random to perform that inference? No. However, if you know that they are not missing at random, then you should model the process of censoring. Right? So suppose they were not missing at random, then let's introduce some variable zi, which tells me whether, let's say, half of the data is missing, half of the coordinates are missing. And then maybe we have some parameter gamma, right? which influences this. So of course, zi will influence x. But it's reasonable to assume that it'll also influence y. For instance, if this is you know, an experimental result from a drug maker, they may not necessarily want to give you all the information whenever their medication comes up negatively. Right? So somebody might be wanting to censor your data in a malicious fashion. So you can do that. You could even have a process by which you assume that, you know, I first generate the data, then I look at the YIs, and then I decide whether I'm going to censor some of the Xs, right? So then this Z moves down here, the arrows get reversed, and then, you know, I can again do the inference. But I would move that down only if I had reason to assume that the censoring actually depends on the outcome of, you know, for instance, my classification. So these things I can very easily deal with in a graphical model, and then it's fairly mechanical, straightforward, what to do in, in order to get to, to a good estimate. 
you can solve most of these problems in a frequent, frequentist approach too. And quite often you can solve them better than in a naive graphical models approach. I mean, you can do fancy graphical models, but there's a good chance that you will be able to design some specialized algorithm which will work better in some cases. And you can prove theorems for that. And that's all very well if you have you know, one of those problems to solve every few months. Because then you have the time to actually derive the theorems, prove them, and do things. I've done that. Um, if you have a reasonably large number of you know, slightly different problems which all change in small tweaks and ways, then you probably don't want to do that. You want to have a reasonably straightforward, idea-proof, simple mechanism by which you can generate new algorithms, new families of algorithms if you easily. And that's exactly what you know, graphical models and related probabilistic modeling is good for. It's the adaptivity and flexibility of the approach that helps. So please don't misunderstand this as me saying that graphical models are uniformly better. They aren't. Because in many cases, any of the probabilities that we're getting are not true in the first place anyway. So it doesn't really matter. However, they are, I would consider them as a device for rapid prototyping and very quickly getting the intuition as to how to solve a problem. And that's where it's really useful. OK, good. So with that aside, um, now let's move on to some more advanced graphical modeling. Any questions so far? Yes? Um, we may have to solve a big integral if we were to do it efficiently, yes. Uh, if, if we wanted to do it accurately. Okay. However, you could, for instance, um, well, either use uh, just Monte Carlo integration. So one possible model for the excise would be to have a mixture of Gaussians. Right? That's probably wrong in most cases, but it's probably good enough in most cases, too. So you have a mixture of Gaussians to estimate, you know, given a few instances where the rest is. You could have something like a Parson Windows estimate as well, which is even easier. Again, that might estimate where, you know, the missing variables are. And the good thing is you're now going to, the more data you have, even if you have, you know, fully observed data, you know, the, the more you're actually going to improve your model for the missing variables. There are a couple of other approaches which um, aim to deal with missing variables. And I have this paradoxical situation that if you don't have any missing variables on your training set, your model is going to be atrociously awful on the test set. Um, so next time you read a missing variables paper, look at that part. And chances are it'll have this nasty property. This one doesn't. And it's basically simple stuff known in the, from the 50s. I mean, you know, I'm not writing anything new here. This stuff is older than me. Probably older than anybody here in the room. OK. Um, so any other questions so far? Good. Then let's move back to fancy models. Okay, so we had the topical engrams, we looked at it, we looked at the side information. Okay, here's a, an interesting model. That's about recommender systems. A variant of that actually runs in some parts of Yahoo in production. So you have like a user, and this is actually a clustering model for the users. We have some observed parameters, we have some latent ones. We observe the rating. There's some context that we have for the rating that we may or may not observe. And then, you know, this is just basically almost like an LDA model for the items. So, and what you assume is that, you know, the average over those topical assignments is going to affect that rating. 
So there's an interesting trick that those guys use, so Deepak Agarwal and uh, Bichung Chen, that's really powerful in practice, even though it looks fairly innocuous on that model. Let me briefly walk you through that. So if you look at this expression here, I mean, these are basically you know, your topics. This is your latent topic vector. Now, if I condition on the topic assignment, no matter what that topic assignment influences downstream, I can integrate out the thetas. That's easy. Because you know, the only way how the thetas depend otherwise is you know, my multinomial, Dirichlet distribution, and then you know, there we go with the actual topic assignments. Doesn't really matter what these zs do downstream. Now, if you would like to have some estimator further downstream, which depends on the topic distribution, so if you wanted to make it depend directly on the thetas, this would actually be rather messy because now you couldn't collapse things anymore. But if you make it depend on those discrete random variables, I can still integrate out theta and get something that's essentially equivalent. So what they do in, in particular is they just take the average values of those zs and make y depend on it. And that's a pretty close proxy to theta. So it's a slight modification of the model. It's not identical. But it makes a very significant difference in terms of computational tractability. Sometimes such little tricks can make all the difference between this being a nice model and you just having no idea on how to solve it efficiently and something that's very easily solvable. So be aware of this. And this is actually sort of a variant of supervised LDA, except that they have the user model in there as well. The other nice thing is this model is fairly nicely composable. So what I mean by composable is I can add more pieces to this model. And you know I can still control it. And all the various components are well calibrated. So that calibration issue is actually quite important. Suppose I have five systems. And I have different losses that I try estimating in all those five systems. Then if I want to jointly optimize everything, well, I can just add the losses together and jointly optimize. Now suppose I rescale one of the losses by a factor of 10. Big trouble, right? Because then all of a sudden I'm going to put all my capacity, all my emphasis on that one single piece and on nothing else. You can do that with risk minimization directly. And if you have a good idea on how those various losses combine, that's probably the right thing to do. If you don't know how to combine them, probabilities are a good way of calibrating this. And I'm not talking about getting it right you know, with a fa within a factor of one or two, but I'm talking about orders of magnitude. So quite often in machine learning, it's orders of magnitude that kill you, not the 1.1 or 1.2. So one thing that you may have been wondering about a little bit is, you know, I've been talking about topic models, and I always assume that somehow we know the number of topics. Of course we don't. Or in clustering, well, what's the right number of clusters? Well, we have no idea. I could put some model selection procedure around it to get the right number of clusters or of topics. And that would be, yeah, kind of awkward, and I would need to you know, design a sampler which has a birth and death process, for instance, or some discrete optimization procedure that, you know, navigates through the various number of topics or clusters. Or I could actually design a process directly that inherently gets that number of topics right. In the Chinese restaurant process or a Dirichlet process, or sometimes it's called the Antoniak process, so it has several names because it needs to have been invented several times by several people, does that. And so I'm going to show you how you get the Chinese restaurant process working. So, you know, here's what you get. So if we want to deal with, you know, how many clusters to pick, well, I could just have, you know, could start with a finite model and then make a limiting argument. So P of Y, so Y is now my you know, <laughs> new cluster assignment, a new topic, given all the, the other Ys and alpha, is, well, if you look at the 
collapsed representation of the Dirichlet process is exactly you know, the number of times I've assigned something to this y plus alpha y. That's the weight for this you know, class divided by n plus the sum over all the alpha y primes. Okay. Now, okay, let me do the algebra explicitly. So what we get is for an existing cluster, we have, so let, let me reparameterize things. Let's define alpha bar to be sum over i going from 1 to k, alpha k. And let's furthermore assume that any of the alpha i's are just alpha bar over k. So my prior probability is uniform for all the clusters. So what I then get is that for an existing cluster, I have p of y given all the y's and alpha. It's just given by ny plus alpha bar over k divided by n plus alpha bar. And the probability for a new cluster given y and alpha is just going to be the sum for all those terms where no cluster has been assigned so far. So it's basically sum over all the i. OK, so sorry, that's actually alpha i, of course. 1, 2, k, alpha i minus sum over j in the assigned set. Because these don't get anything, divided by n plus alpha bar. So that's nothing else than alpha bar plus some constant, let's just call it m for the moment, times alpha bar over k divided by n plus alpha bar. Okay. So I now have a, you know, I've just rewritten my model for you know, what the probability is for a new cluster and for, you know, assigning to an existing cluster. So now I'm going to let k go to infinity while keeping alpha bar fixed. Well, what's going to happen? Well, oh, I'm sorry, yes, it's a minus, yes. Thanks. Minus remains minus, yes. Okay. So what's going to happen if I let k go to infinity? Well, this term disappears. Now here, well, m is finite, k is going to infinity, so this term also disappears. So in other words, this goes to ny over n plus alpha bar, and this goes to alpha bar over n plus alpha bar. Okay. Now let's look at the expected number of you know clusters that we get if we have n points. So what we can see is so and you you can prove and I'm not going to do that right now that this distribution that we just got is exchangeable. In other words, the order in which I observe various instances doesn't really matter, so I can just you know, add one point at a time as I go along. You can check that, for instance, through the fact that, well, the order in which I received the previous instance doesn't matter for the next item. And a few more arguments, and that I can you know, pull one out and put the other one in, and things remain the same. Um, so what I get is that the expected number of clusters is going to be 
the sum i going from 1 to n. And so it's going to be, so actually i going from 0 to n minus 1, I have that, alpha bar over i plus alpha bar. Okay, so everybody knows what that looks like. This is basic, this basically is order log n. So in other words, the number of clusters that I'm going to get is order log number of instances that I'm seeing, but the specific number of cores is a random variable and it depends on the evidence that I see. So that is one mechanism for controlling the number of clusters that I get. Yes? Um, this is this should be alpha bar. Yes. Yes. So the alpha on the slides is alpha bar. You're absolutely right. Thanks. So you can also view that in the context of the Chinese restaurant process. So, and that has proven a useful metaphor sometimes for designing new distributions. So the Chinese restaurant process, just to give you an idea, works as follows. So you assume you have a Chinese restaurant, you know, one of those really huge cavernous ones that you can find in some places, which have an infinite number of tables. Or at least where there's always a free table somewhere. And so you have a person coming in, and he picks a table. Okay, and since you know it's the first person, okay, he just comes here, you know. Now, the second person who comes along will be more likely to pick the first table, namely they'll pick it with probability n1 divided by n1 divided by the total number of people so far, in 1 plus alpha. And they'll pick a new table with probability alpha over n plus alpha. So the second person comes in and, well, unfortunately, he picks a new table. The third person comes in and maybe they now pick table two because, well, there was already somebody sitting there. So. and so on and so on. So you have that self-reinforcing process where the number of people assigned to a cluster or a table increases with the number of people who are sitting at a table. So you assume you have basically tables of infinite size. Now, there's an easy way how you can turn that, for instance, into a hierarchical Chinese restaurant process. Basically, what you do is after everybody sat down at these tables, I now treat each table as a black box on its own and send them to another restaurant with, smaller, without, with more tables. And they again distribute according to that. Gives you hierarchical clustering. If you want to have, you know, further hierarchies, again you take this and send it to another set of smaller tables. And unfortunately now the font size is too small. If you want to have a tree where people stay at various levels of the table, well, that's very easy too. Basically, I just allow people to stay seated at the table where they are rather than move on to the new restaurant. This is, for instance, a paper then by Ryan Adams, Mike Jordan, and Subin Garamani. NIPS 2010. Where you allow people to stay at that table. The picture that I showed you at the first lecture with the lawnmowers and basically you know, the hierarchical image clustering with the lawnmowers is exactly derived based on that process. I have a fairly interesting stick breaking construction, and I'm not going to go into this stick breaking constru construction of Ishwaran, but if you're interested in it, it's actually worth a read.
the basic idea is you assume you have a stick of unit length, and you break off a first portion that, that whose fragment is distributed according to the beta distribution. You break off a piece, you take the remainder of the stick, you apply the same, same stick breaking construction again. You basically treat that again as a stick of unit length, break off a piece, and you keep on fragmenting it. And so you can see that the sizes, you know, decrease exponentially, the expected sizes, which gives you some idea of why you get that logarithmic number of clusters. Now, you may not always exactly want to have a logarithmic number of clusters. In some cases, you may want to have more than a logarithmic number of clusters. There's something called a pitman ur process. And so, if in the Dirichlet process we basically had NY divided by N plus alpha, that was in the DP, and furthermore alpha over N plus alpha, that's for the existing and that's for the new cluster assignment, what the pitman ur process does is it modifies these parameters here. So it has some coefficient here. And then to make everything sum up again, it adds something plus one minus C times N here. So what this does is it now prevents this ratio here from getting way too small. And that way you can get polynomial, well, I mean, as in, basically into some small exponent type of growth of the number of clusters. There's a lot more beautiful stuff in this context, so you know you basically need to read up on the details. And there's a lot of stuff that I cannot go into. <coughs> okay. Good. Now let's move on further to the Chinese restaurant metaphor in the context of time-dependent modeling and the recurrent Chinese restaurant process. Okay, because we actually had to deal with a problem of that kind in Yahoo. Um, so that's exactly what I showed you before, just drawn in much prettier pictures. So yeah, Amr Ahmed made those pretty figures. I think he did it really well. So now one thing that you might we have to deal with is time series of objects like news stories, they appear and they disappear and you want to keep track of clusters automatically. So this is a process where you know you have an incoming stream of objects and they may belong to existing clusters but chances are pretty high that you will actually get new clusters. So yes occasionally you will pick up an old story again but you know new things happen. You know new revolutions happen, new people get murdered, new banks go bankrupt and, you know, other disasters, earthquakes, what have you. Now, you can assume that there's essentially a constant stream of news in the news. Occasionally nothing happens and occasionally a lot of things happen, but you never know when. So what you would like to be able to do is you would like to be able to detect what the new event is and track it and so on. So here's a simple mechanism on how to do this. And this, you know, builds off the Chinese restaurant process. Suppose we have the chi a Chinese restaurant process and that fills our tables on day one. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to remember how many people sat at various tables. Once I have this, I can then go and just, you know, put cardboard figures, so to say, at each of the tables to attract people the next day. And, you know, people are gullible, so they sit down even next to the cardboard figures, and I see who's going to be there, right? And so basically the previous day's people assignment will affect how many people will sit there the next day. And then, well, 
I go and you know I sample accordingly, and you know I have new people assigned to the table the next day. Then I use this assignment as a prior for the day afterwards, right? So some clusters may die out and might get new ones. And of course, you don't necessarily need to use only the previous day's history, but you can actually use a longer chain. So it's very simple. Now, if this looks awfully very much like time series modeling to you, yes, it is. And this is about the most ham-fisted way how you can deal with such time series modeling in a non-parametric sense. We're actually at the moment looking at much better models. But that's not published yet. This is about the dumbest way, basically just a smoothing average over the past to predict the future. There's very little learning in there. We don't really learn you know, those weighting parameters very much. Yes, you could learn them. But basically, this is almost like an autoregressive model where by fiat I decide what the uh, you know, the autoregressive coefficient should be. Of course that's wrong. Of course it works actually quite well. So to give you a bit of an idea of what you get. So <clears throat> this is a standard Dirichlet process and basically this is just plotting, you know, when you know, a new cluster starts and how long it lasts and, you know, most of the cl clusters once they are there, they last forever. And if I have them per epoch independently, then each cluster, of course, only will last an epoch long. But if I have this time-dependent model, and this is just some exponential downweighting, then this is the chain duration that I get, right? And it follows a nice power law. So that's exactly what you want. Because that's basically, for instance, for news, a good way of dealing with the length of a sequence. Yes? Can you mention again what's the difference between the DKMM and the independent DKMM? Okay. So basically, this one simply groups all the epochs together into one single epoch, and that one just treats each epoch independently. And this process interpolates between that. So there's actually a nice paper by Fraser and Bly. which have come up with yet another way of modeling such dependent processes. And they call it a distance-dependent Chinese restaurant process. I'm not going to go into much detail here, but it's essentially built off a preferential attachment process. And then you can play very much with the attachment function. And that works reasonably well. And it gives you very simple algorithms, which will, for instance, give you image segmentation that work as well or better as the best models that, for instance, uh, Eric Sudat and Mike Jordan came up with, but with vastly simpler algorithms, with vastly simpler implementation and all that. So, and that's what I believe actually is quite big progress because, well, there's no point in designing an algorithm that's so hideously complicated that nobody else will re-implement it. User modeling. So this gets us to the time-dependent modeling now for some of the process that we talked about yesterday. And I think I got five questions about it yesterday. So um, suppose you want to buy a camera. By the way, very much recommend it. It's a very good camera, LX5. So you can probably tell from that I have it. Um, when would you want to show an ad? Who suggests that I should be showing an ad there when the user decides, well, OK, I want to buy a camera? Here's when he starts searching for cameras. And there it is when he's actually bought it. OK. Who suggests I should be showing an ad here? OK. Who suggests I should be showing an ad here? Who suggests I should be showing an ad here? OK. So why should I show an ad here after I've bought the camera? 
tell me. Mm. No, after I've bought the camera, it's no point in showing an ad, right? I mean, maybe I can sell you a tripod and a camera bag and some memory chips. But <clears throat> that's game over. I've already bought it. It's too late. Here, well, I wish we could. Because after all, this is just when I, in my mind, have decided, well, I might actually go and buy a camera. But I haven't actually interacted with a computer yet very much that might give it away. This is the golden opportunity. That's where you want to show ads. There, it's really hard. There, it's too late. It's super annoying when you get all the ads after you've bought the device, right? Because, well, you know, they might even show you an ad for something that, where you can get it cheaper, right? And you're thinking, hmm, I really should have bought it somewhere else. Right? So, how can we detect this? Here's a way how we can do this. So, one way is to really get ideas of the user activity. So, a user might actually, you know, start searching for various things. And they just keep on doing that. Right. And then, well, that actually affects amounts to you know, various interest profiles that change over time. Right? And so the input of data that we get from the user are like, for instance, queries that are issued by the user or tags of watch content, maybe emails he sends to various people, pages he views, anything you can imagine that we can log. And let's say we get it at a one-day resolution. What we would like to be able to do is we would like to be able to annotate, at least on a daily basis, what the user's been up to. Ideally, you would like to be able to do that at a much shorter scale. And there are other mechanisms to deal with that to some extent. So here's a model that we use. We use LDA, where the user distribution, user interest distribution changes over time. So I might be interested in cameras now, but maybe not tomorrow anymore. Maybe tomorrow I'll be wanting to buy lots of diapers because I have a baby. Um, the topics themselves change over time. So for instance, maybe I'm interested in cell phones. Now, I might be interested in cell phones all the time, but the different cell phones that come on the market will change and affect my search behavior. You know, I probably wouldn't be looking for a Motorola Razr nowadays, right? And who knows what I would be looking for. Maybe, you know, rather than Android and iPhone, it might be some very different device. And so what I basically have is that the objects that I'm tracking themselves change. And also, the users change. So let's just compare what happens. This is our plain LDA model. OK. So that's like my prior distribution over topics. That's the topic distribution for, let's say, a user. This would be the topics of an individual action. That's the action. That's the action distribution per topic, and that's the smoother. Okay. Now, what we do is we basically just replicate that t times. And each time step, now I'm assuming that the prior distribution over topics is a varying function over time. This may be, you know, on Christmas, Christmassy things are more popular that the user's interest distribution changes over time. OK, so we have topics and actions. That the, well, action distribution per topic itself is time dependent. So that deals, for instance, with the fact that different phones might be more popular at different times. And then the MI smoother changes slowly too. So. What this, the reason why I'm putting this up here is because it's conceptually very simple to go from here to there. All I've done is I've just said, well, you know, most things change. User modeling is not the only place where you could use this. For instance, imagine I give you a collection of books when I ask you what the books are about, are about. And I happen to give you, amongst others, War and Peace. It's over a thousand pages you know, five tomes. 
So if you, if I ask you what is war and peace about, well, you know, you'll tell me it's about everything, right? It's basically for a period of 100 years, everything that happened in Russia during the Napoleonic Wars, before and after. So asking about the topic of war and peace is a really daft question. But if you ask something like, what is chapter number 20 about? That may be a pretty good question. So what you would want is, you would want to be able to tell what the topics are about in various locations, as I have essentially a position-dependent topic distribution within that you know, masterpiece of Russian literature. So again, I would have the same model. I would basically assume that maybe the word distribution changes. I might actually fix that, assuming that you know, the vocabulary of the author hasn't changed. It might be slightly different between authors, so I might impose some conditioning here. I would then you know, have a page-dependent topic distribution. I would probably allow the topic to change more between chapters rather than between pages, because chapters tend to have, correspond to logical breakpoints. And then you happily model along. Question, right? If you wanted to extend this to multiple users, would that be so multiple users in the same model? This, this deals with multiple users in the same model, right? Because basically each of those plates here is a user. And OK, actually what I would have had to do is you know, pull that inner plate out and stuff the rest into it. But it's basically the same user tracked over time and have many users. So you, know, you will have between maybe 100 million and a billion users. So our user numbers are somewhere between those two. So, so there's no additional conditioning on alpha and beta? Um, well, you will probably want to do additional things, like, for instance, if I know where the user is from, I can use that. If I know when the user is interacting with the web, I can use that. For instance, you will be probably doing different things on the weekend rather than you know, during, the, during weekdays. You might do different things during daytime and during, at night. If you know, for instance, the age and gender of the user, it might give away a lot of things what they might be doing. For instance, suppose the user is male in his 20s and he's surfing the web at 2 a.m. in the morning. Go figure. Um, right? So these things can help you a lot to get better models of you know, what the user is currently going to do, what's in his state of mind. In addition to that, of course, you would not just want to have a bag of words model. So most users don't behave like Sippy the Pinhead. Basically, your previous query will actually affect the next query. You might have query chains. You can probably use the time, so the duration, between different queries to tell you something about what they're doing. So there are lots of additional attributes that you can make this model more complicated with. And that's currently under fairly active development. And that's where a lot of engineering comes in. Basically, you know, this is not something where you can just say, well, OK, define this to be a model. You actually need to talk to you know, somebody who understands the users. And they will tell you, well, we believe it depends on x, y, z, and those other things. In some cases, you might have additional information, like, for instance, you know, what things they subscribe to. And ideally, you just want to squeeze out as much data from the entire system as you can. So for instance, if you're Facebook, you can probably use the location or Yelp. I don't know how much they use that, but they ought to. Um, so let's see how that works. All right, so we have some activity distribution. Here's some topics. And mind you, these are actual topics that we found. The only thing that's user-generated, manually generated, is that we named them. So for some reason, Amr named this diet. Well, I'm not sure whether pizza, butter, and milk are diet, but <laughs> OK. 
Um, food is probably better. And so what you assume is that you, know, you have maybe some long-term interest distribution. You might have a monthly and a short-term interest distribution. And now a mix of all of those is going to affect a, and give us a prior of what the user is going to be up to right now. This is like the crudest model you could design, right? So it's like long-term, month, and weekly. And that's why I said, well, you want to actually do something slightly better. But even that already works quite well. And then you can use that to infer with suitable weighting coefficients what the user's up at time t plus 1. And then, OK, we get that for you know, several users. We can use what other users do to affect as well what that user's going to do the next day. Right? Gives us a new prior. And then we get our simple generative process. So let's just look at the global picture. That gives you some more ideas. Okay. So globally, this is maybe the interest and topic distribution over time. User 1 maybe only shows up at days 1, 3, and 4. User 2 only shows up at day 2. And user 3 shows up at days 1 and 4. Now, what user 4 is up to will depend on what is currently popular at day 3, sorry, day 4, and also what is done at day 1. For user 2, if we've never seen him before, well, that's really useful. So. Now you might wonder, OK, how do I know it's the same user? So that's why I suggested you should install Ghostry in your browser. And you will see all the various trackers that various websites have. I think the New York Times has something like eight different trackers on their site. And what they do is they set different types of cookies and do different types of interesting profiling. So I think about two, three months ago, there was somebody who showed that you can basically design cookies that you can't get rid of. And the way they do this is they set the regular cookie, which, OK, whenever I go to a site, well, the browser sends that cookie to the server, and you know, therefore the server recognizes it. But what you can also do is you can set cookies in Flash. And Flash is particularly nasty because you can't really get rid of them. You also know the person's IP number. I might go and store various files in his cache. And by storing a choice set of files in the cache, I can actually go and you know, basically get the information as to who the user is. I can go and, for instance, use the browser configuration itself to get things. So there's, if you're curious, because most of you have the laptop open, you should go to a website called panopticlick.eff.org. So go and try it out now if you want. And by the way, this will also give you a fine example of wrong statistics. Okay, so the nice things that happen on, uh, that, that it shows is it basically shows you that your browser configuration is probably more unique than you think. For instance, you can query from the browser which fonts you have installed. And most of us will have a different random set of fonts installed. That's a pretty good fingerprinting measure. We will have different plugins installed, different versions of plugins. All of that gives away who you are. So even without setting a cookie, I can probably track you. And people do that. Now, to the wrong application of, uh, panopti of statistics in PanopticClick, they measure various attributes and they check how unique they are. And then they say the uniqueness of a user is the product of the uniquenesses of the attributes. And that's bullshit. Um, sorry. Uh, basically, um, and you can easily check it out if you, for instance, try that out with your iPhone. Because your iPhone will have only a small set of configurations. And it just is patently plain wrong that P 
of A and B is P of A times P of B. And that's the assumption they make. And that's why they get much more unique users. That they treat you as more unique than what you actually are. So it's horribly wrong what they do. But it gives you a good idea of what you can do. OK. Um, here's an example of some sample users. We already discussed them before. Um, now these are some small data sets. By now, we have those numbers up by a few orders of magnitude. So that was data from about a year ago. And you know these are small data sets, about 400 gigabytes of user data. It's not very much. Uh, that's for some advertising campaigns, you know, over about two months of data, different number of active users, you know, some real toy data that we wanted to see what to do with. So this is a small data set. Um, that's what you care about. Basically, the taller the rate bar, the better, because that means basically making more money. And these are score improvements for showing ads. I don't need to go into specific details, because the numbers are so obfuscated that you couldn't make any sense of it anyway. It basically tells you that if you get the topics, in addition to all the baseline features like words and so on that you have, you can actually improve the ad relevance quite a bit. That's all you really care about in this context. The setting is actually a little bit different here. We ask the question, OK, given that I've seen those users who convert well, can I find similar users that have the same properties? So this type of retargeting is actually reasonably common on the internet. One way is also to simply try to see whether you can get the same users back and sell them a second device. That's currently very popular. But this allows you to do something much more powerful, namely to find users that behave in the same way and target at them. There's a lot of companies out there that, who do that. For instance, Conterra, Efficient Frontier, and so on. There's a lot of advertising companies which optimize for you how to display your content. Okay. Now, here's how we deal with that in the context of the systems. And that's still written out with memcached, but by now it's replaced with a different library. So we sample for all the users. We write the accounts that we get into our memcached. We synchronize things. We then, at the end of the day, write things to disk. We do that for a number of reasons. First of all, our machines might fail. Secondly, we'll need that data subsequently anyway. Then, you know, we compute some aggregate statistics. That's actually not so good because all the other machines are idle. But it's faster rather than restarting Hadoop. And then we just deal with the next day. And if the machines fail, we just hot start from wherever we are. OK, I think now is a good time to take a short break. If you've got questions, well, let's talk a bit briefly, and then we have a short break. Vishy, how much time do we have for the break? I have until 10.30, well, but I think we probably should have a short break yeah. because, you know, attention span and all that. Okay, any questions right now? Okay, good. If everything's clear, let's have a short break for, well, let's say until five minutes past the half hour, so in other words, 9.35, and we start at 9.35 sharp. As in, I will start at 9.35 sharp. If you're not there, you're just not there. <laughs>